Um, so I'm Mark Shaw from Doug and Morris Architects. I'm going to talk about the Autus Learning Centre, um, which is a building f um, for the Mortgage Charity um, for the Concrete Centre. So um, the building is located in South London. It is on the campus of the Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, um, which is adjacent to the campus for the Institute of Psychiatry. And um, on this site, they train um, more psychiatrists um, than anywhere else in the world in a year. Um, and it's also one of the world leading um, institutions for mental health. But yet, their buildings are very poor quality. And in fact, um, the trust was spending a huge amount of money every year on renting other spaces around London to hold events, conferences, meetings. Um, and they felt that they were kind of a bit embarrassed about bringing people to the campus. Um, so um, the trust actually has a charitable foundation, which is a separate entity, which all the assets of the trust are owned by, um, which is very substantial. Um, it's been going since 1610. Um, and um, they have been quite a sleepy organisation um, of late. Until recently, they appointed a new, very dynamic, visionary chairman who said, we're going to invest the resources that we have in, um, in the campus and in new facilities. And um, we're going to start with learning and education and trying to use the research that the Trust does, which is just fantastic stuff, and actually using it for the benefit of um, mental health and wellbeing. So um, the Trust... Um, came to appointed us as architects to um, actually develop the brief for the building. So they said, you know, we want you to tell us what um, we should be building. What is a what is a learning centre? You know, what what's going to happen in there? Um, at that point, they didn't know how big the building was going to be, how much it was going to cost, what was going to happen in there. But they set set us the task of discovering and researching and engaging. We call it the immersion program. We did it for probably about 10 months. We interviewed so many people, we visited about 30 buildings all over the world, all over Britain. We ran workshops, so this slightly odd slide is that um, we ran workshops with all of the sort of key people in the trust um, to, to ask them what they were teaching, what they learn, how do, how do people learn, what they do was really starting it with a blank sheet of paper. Um, and um, we came up with these 10 vision statements which sort of were our guiding principles through the, the rest of the project. So every time we introduced new people to the team, we would just explain that these are the things that we're trying to do with the project um, and that it should be world-class. Everyone kept using this expression, you know, what is world-class learning? What's a world-class building? How can we do what best thing that we can do? Um, that it should be for, um, for change, that it should encourage change in the organisation. Um, it should be a hub for teaching and learning. So at the moment they were doing teaching and learning all over the campus in little funny little rooms and sometimes, you know, in a hotel somewhere in Elephant and Castle and they wanted to bring it all together so everyone was talking to each other, everyone knew each other and that there was some sort of dynamism going on with the learning. Um, and that obviously it had to be innovative and construction, it had to be sustainable, um, it had to promote interaction, it had to be welcome and friendly. And friendly. So the Trust had a problem with um, some of its facilities being um, sort of slightly counterintuitive to use. The building that actually was knocked down that we on our site was a very strange 70s building with no windows and no air conditioning and no technology and terrible furniture and all these problems. So they wanted a complete change of culture. Um, and they also wanted it to encourage, we kept saying, learning by anyone, anywhere, at any time. So it's not just a building, but it, it was... To, to encourage people to learn all over um, wherever they were, but all connected back to this building. So they actually set up a, a, a company, a learning company, um, it's a, which is a not-for-profit not um, organisation which um, actually does the teaching. So it's a really innovative, it's not just the building, it's a really innovative project. Um, in terms of the location and the site, um, we're located on Grove Lane, which is... Um, you can see on the slide, and it's located in Camberwell, and parallel to that is Camberwell Grove, and they are the most staggeringly beautiful Georgian 
streets I've ever seen in my life and some of the best preserved Georgian houses anywhere in London. And you know, we couldn't help but be quite sort of taken by these, these buildings and, and, and sort of absorbed by them in the context. And we studied them quite carefully and we studied um, the proportions and the hierarchy and things like, you can see on these two slides, the, the different setbacks from the street and um, the particular details were picked out, this horizontal banding, the brickwork, the windows, and you know what, what makes these buildings appealing and what do we like about them. And some of them were semi-detached, some of them were terraced, and some of them were detached, and all these things. Um, and I think we felt like the building needed to feel like it was part of that environment rather than a kind of um, you know, alien that just sort of arrived. And we wanted it to feel part of its location. Um, so there's a very long design process, but. I'll explain more about that in a minute, but to come round to the, the actual plan, we ended up with a really simple plan, and all of the research that we did in the first phase kind of led us to realise that actually what they wanted was just really great space, that was un, we, we we're not going to be prescriptive about rooms and what they do, and there's not going to be a library and a computer room and a reading room and all these things, it's just really fantastic beautiful space that you can subdivide in whichever way you want. So essentially the building's divided into three, the plan's divided into three, and um, on each, you've got a wing on either side which is where the rooms are, and in the centre you have a hole in the middle um, which has, a, um, it's all about the environmental um, performance of the building and the core um, on the other side. So you can subdivide um, these rooms into three with folding sliding partitions or you can pull them back and have a really big space. So that gives them a huge amount of flexibility and they can reconfigure the rooms into different sizes for different sorts of things and they spend the whole time moving the furniture around and it gives them you know, brilliant um, flexibility. Um, on the ground floor, ground and what we call upper ground, we managed to, um, to we were working all the time with the project manager, um, Ken Cowdery, who was sort of instrumental in the whole project. He didn't work for the charity, but he was brought in as a sort of um, project champion. We were always running lots of business plan numbers on how big the building's going to be and how many rooms there were and how we could, um, they could generate revenue because it had to be a sustainable building. Um, we managed to encourage them to leave the entire ground and upper ground floor, just a large proportion of the building, completely unprogrammed. So there are no um, rooms here that um, you can um, take over and there's a cafe and there's a sort of central space where there's steps um, which become an auditorium and then on the upper deck there's a, a big space which they do all kinds of different things in and the idea of that was to have space on the campus where people feel like they can just go have a meeting sit down have a coffee have a chat um, and sort of hopefully generate ideas about what they're doing and research and teaching etc and it works really well. Um, in section, um, the building has an um, internal concrete in situ frame, and then the facade is uh, precast concrete with brickwork and glazing. Um, and we wanted um, the um, the materials to be as simple as possible, as few materials as possible, and just all expressed. So there's no, there's nothing's hidden. There's no plasterboard anywhere in the entire building. Um, you see everything and everything's really just simply detailed. The section going the other way, um, the building sits on Denmark Hill, so you have um, a sort of gently sloping site and we wanted to, like the Georgian houses do, sort of um, engage with the level change and so the, um, the section is split, so the floor plan is actually cranked and what that does is it creates um, a more dynamic space in the centre where um, the, the large staircase is, which is um, the idea that people will meet and um, bump into each other and just sort of spend time um, around the space and that you get sort of views and glimpses across the half landing rather than sort of this kind of more like a sort of dead atrium space. It's, it's much more dynamic. Um, in terms of the sustainable um, the sustainability, the, this, this section explains um, how um, the building is completely passive, so there's no mechanical ventilation anywhere. 
Um, there are windows on the facade which open um, with actuators. On, there's a built BMS computer system which um, detects the temperature and CO2. The windows open and then the air moves through um, attenuators in the walls of the teaching spaces and into this uh, atrium space and up and out through the roof light, which also has vents which are automatic and controlled. So the building um, is uh, very low energy because um, there's no mechanical ventilation, you get natural fresh air coming in um, and all the thermal mass of the concrete exposed in the spaces um, um, works really well for the temperature. Um, so to talk about the facade a little bit, um, we spent a long time uh, making models and um, investigating you know, what do we want the facade to say and what, what does it want to express and we knew that we wanted to split the floor plan um, and we investigated many different um, ways of doing this and uh, sometimes potentially losing the split in the windows and sometimes expressing it and I think in the end we just realised that we wanted the facade to just tell the story of what's happening inside the building. So although it's a very, very strict um, 1200 module um, grid all the way around this precast concrete fins, within that grid there's different things going on. So where you have a terrace, there are no windows and there's a balustrade. Where there's a double height space, there's no windows and there's brickwork. Um, on the rear facade, it's different again. So um, the, the building's sort of explaining um, what's happening. We also did some uh, CGI's um, quite early on, um, which were to investigate the material qualities and the depth of the facade and the concrete and everything else. So you can see the four elevations there. Um, that's what I was saying about um, the grid being very clear, but then having a, a second layer. So you can see terraces, and there's inboard terraces which sit within the facade. And there's, um, for example, on the west elevation where the core is, and you have a staircase and toilets, there aren't any windows. Um, it's brick and precast concrete and steel framed windows, and Janssen windows. So the frame um, is a 50% GGBS mix, which was partly um, for sustainability reasons, so it's half the amount of cement that you would um, use on ordinary concrete mix. Um, and also to make the concrete lighter, so it's, it's very light and creamy kind of texture, and I think um, there were a few um, people that were a bit nervous about um, having lots of exposed concrete in the building because and they were um, used to Guy's Hospital, which is very grey, and we said to them, actually, it's not going to be grey, it's going to be white and, and soft, and the mix, and we worked with Elaine at the Concrete Centre on the mix and on the specification, um, and, um, yeah, I think it's probably a good point to just explain a little bit about the procurement route, so it's quite an unusual um, contract. We, we knew that the client was, didn't want to do a JCT contract, they were nervous about um, time, and cost overruns and they told us that the building had to be finished on time and had to be finished on budget but there was a nervousness also about doing design and build um, so we chose a partnering contract where it's very much the sort of ethos of the charity to bring everyone people together and um, so it's a partnering contract called the PPC 2000 um, and there's a core group of architect, engineer, QS, construction manager, project manager and environmental engineer and we all worked together to solve um, everything and, and there was no kind of adversarial um, sort of approach and all the subcontractors were employed directly by the client. So they were all brought to the table um, really early in the design process. The idea being that we extract all the knowledge from the experts to help us to get to the right solution and build it um, on time and for the price and also with the quality that we wanted. Um, it was that was actually quite difficult because um, every package was tendered individually, and they all were over budget, and we had to get them all into the budget. So we had to work really hard with everyone to um, think about how we could um, achieve what we wanted to do within the cost framework. And that was quite challenging. Um, the frame is um, it's all special finished concrete exposed so 
um, the contractor had to um, understand this. So we had to, when we did all the tender interviews with the, with the subcontractor for the concrete, we sat them down and we said, you know, do you realise what what we're actually trying to do here? Um, there's a rib, the rib slab is quite important, and the ribs run on the either side of the the kind of the staircase um, central space. Um, the, uh, the sort of um, maximum span that you can do the ribs with the um, the design of the of the rebar and everything, and um, that sort of sets up the the module. And then within the frame are um, all of the electrical services are cast in, so it's full of cast in conduits which allow the lighting um, and all the other technology to sort of sit in the slab zone. So we had to set out, this drawing shows um, a typical ceiling and everything was set out, the lighting, smoke detectors and absence detectors and all of the projectors and we had to set this all out before they started building the formwork, um, which was quite difficult but um, we, met, we, we met the deadlines and it was built on time. Um, so to talk about the, the facade in a little bit more detail, again with this partnering contract and not having a main contractor, and having to meet the cost plan, um, the original idea was that the building, these um, sort of facade elements would arrive um, on a lorry and just be slotted into the frame, that they would be prefabricated somewhere. And we spoke to all the prefabricated people, the big um, firms like Techcrete and Marble Mosaic and Decomo, um, but um, we couldn't afford we couldn't afford to do it like that. So just we just didn't have the um, the budget. So what we did instead was we actually broke it down and we spoke to each of the individual people that make and do these things and actually brought them together in a team ourselves and managed to do what we wanted to do and meet the cost plan. So um, we actually did a, an awful lot of work to explain how the facade would work. So we start with a concrete um, in situ frame um, and then we described and we spoke to the fixing manufacturers and we spoke to um, Cambridge Architectural Precast and we had lots of meetings with them and design workshops to just find the absolutely most efficient way to do it with the minim minimal amount of, um, of cost to, to, to make sure that we could do what we wanted to do. Um, and we drew all, the, all of these um, drawings and components. Um, the, the precast was attached to the, the in situ concrete frame and then once an elevation was finished the, the brickwork could then um, go on at its, in, its own, in its own time and its own speed taking it off the critical path and then the windows were inserted and, and actually fixed to the precast concrete um, with, um, which had cast in fixing so there was a lot of work, there was a lot of detail there's a lot of coordination that had to happen in here, which took a lot of time, but it meant that when it actually was built, that just there were no hiccups. It just happened, and everything slotted together perfectly. We scheduled out every single piece of precast, uh, which took again took a long time. And this is the sort of thing that Decomo, one of these specialist people, would have probably done. Um, and there's some images of, of the the vertical fins and the horizontal banding. And that's the south elevation under construction. So you can see where we have the main entrance, for example. Um, it's another special condition within the grid. You just have blank panels of concrete and there's a, a canopy which um, projects to sort of signal the entrance. Um, I think it's also important to talk about um, the internal environment. So um, it's a, a building for people that are um, specialists in mental health. And um, we we wanted the building to have a domestic feel, domestic qualities that people felt relaxed. You know, they kept um, to telling us that mental health is about people, and it's about talking, and it's about engaging with people and conversations, and people um, feeling at home and relaxed. And I think um, what's relevant here is that although we've got concrete and it's all exposed concrete everywhere, we have another layer on the internal uh, in the internal environment, which is other sorts of finishes which um, work really well with the concrete and that's timber floor for example you can see here and um, fabric so we have all around the perimeter of the building there's a curtain track internally and you can just there's um, wool felt curtains which you can pull across and um, can change the acoustic of the spaces or change the feeling you can black out if you're doing a presentation 
in the centre of this is the ground and upper ground space. Um, there are a slightly different pair of curtains which are the only colour that we have in the building uh, which is the sort of uh, the charity sort of colour and you can pull those curtains across and actually have a presentation here and they have silent disco headphones that they wear um, and sit and there's a projector screen that drops down. Um, there's also the cafe and um, all of the furniture we um, specified and it's all um, powder coated RAL 7044 which is the closest RAL colour we could get to match the concrete. So all of the furniture, the tables um, and in fact all the metalwork in the building is RAL 7044, the windows, the roof light, the balustrade um, and it was trying to create a really neutral, soft, subtle environment soft palette, soft sort of background to what was going to happen in the building because we realised that um, these rooms would just be full of people, bags and coats and stuff and actually that's what brings all the life and the character and the building should just be very um, soft and, and comfortable and have a kind of domestic feel so we have carpets on the floor, curtains and nice soft comfortable furniture to make it feel um, like a space that people want to be in. Um, there's no security in the building whatsoever, so there's no reception, there's no turnstiles, you don't have to sign in. Again, all part of the, uh, coming from the initial research and the division, to have a building that was welcome, accessible to all and friendly. So you come in, ground floor, there's just a welcome table where there's people sitting that you can go and talk to if you want to ask them something. Or um, the, We designed all of the wayfinding and the signage as well, so it's really obvious when you come in, there's a site that tells you what's happening today and which room it's in and where it is and you can easily find it. The building's very easy to navigate. Um, the central atrium on the right here, you can see sometimes the staircases get wider, so we've got big steps that people sit on, cushions, um, the lighting's all um, been very carefully designed so that it's soft and subtle. Um, and the space, this is the ground and upper ground space, you can see the large steps um, people sit on, the curtains, the furniture, we've got concrete, polished concrete floor in the cafe space. And this image also shows um, the ribs, um, the concrete ribs spanning across the width of the teaching spaces and the wings. And all of the lighting um, is contained within the depth of the, of the rib. And then all the technology is concealed within a raft which runs in, inside the rib, um, which has you know, cameras for filming lectures, there's speakers for sound, there's all kinds of detectors for the intelligent building management system, that's all concealed in there. And also in there there's um, acoustic foam which um, helps with the reverberation, so these rafts run every sort of third or fourth bay. Um, and again the fabric is matched to the concrete colour. So you can see the raft there, speakers and various other things. Um, so as well as these wings being able to subdivide into three, um, we've actually got a sort of range of different spaces um, so on the sort of top floor for example those we just miss the floor out and you have double height space um, and then there's also in the centre of that level there's a terrace so you've, you've always got um, external space available um, and the fire strategy for the building is actually completely bespoke it's not a part B building so we had to sort of rewrite the fire strategy completely so that we could have a single staircase um, condition with, large, with gr greater capacity on the floor. So there's 80 people per floor here um, with a single escape stair and that was all really carefully worked out. And you can see um, the folding sliding partitions of these white um, things on the right hand side. And that was, we just went for the most expensive system we could get so that they're really easy to use and they work and they're just you know, they can reconfigure the rooms um, on a daily basis, sometimes several times a day. You can see here the brick work um, is the external skin and it's also the internal skin of the facade. So you've really only got concrete brickwork and windows as a sort of as the skin, everything's on exposed. And the, um, the curtains here on the upper ground level, you can just pull across and create a temporary room for a meeting or presentation or an exhibition. So that's the north facade. You can see the terraces on the top floor where uh, because we're on Denmark Hill the view of London is absolutely amazing 
um, and we've got two special rooms upstairs here which um, they are very popular because they have a terrace and they have a view view from the sort of southeast corner occasionally we have the exposed um, the in situ frame and you see it adjacent to the precast and I think there's something quite nice about seeing the two types of concrete next to each other and sort of expressing that there's, there's a frame and there's a skin and they work together. The brickwork was, um, we spent a long time trying to find um, the right brick and in the end we found really quite cost effective brick from the UK, from Haywards Heath um, called Freshfield Lane and what we did we actually um, used two blends so all the building that touches the ground, the ground floor, um, is in a kind of red brick. Most of the Maudsley buildings are red brick. But on the upper levels, we, we changed to this sort of grey, purpley grey blend, which is much softer and greyer. Um, and, but we mixed 10% of the red from the base into the top, and it's all mixed in the works, so that when it arrived on site, the brick layers just put the bricks in. So this sort of red, brick that sort of filters up through the upper layers. Um, the final image is um, just showing how few materials there are. It's in situ concrete, brickwork and joinery. And that's, that's the palette, very subtle and simple and everything's exposed and expressed, simple detailing. That's it.